So my name is Daniel Smith, and I'll be pre uh, presenting on the protection hypervisor, an out of sized hypervisor design. So the purpose of this talk. So today is to give some design details along with the status, as well as give an opportunity for the Zen community to provide some input and or requirements for the, the design and implementation of, of PX. Um, what I hope everybody will gain from this talk is uh, I will give a quick review of PX and where it came from in terms of its place in the hat architecture. We'll do a quick review of nested virtualization. We'll work through the understanding of how PX is being designed and developed. Uh, we'll take a little bit of a deeper dive into it and then look at the current status, uh, look at some alternative use cases, uh, one in specific, and then we can dive into some discussion and requirements gathering from the community. So background on, on the plat, uh, protection hypervisor. So uh, in 2019, I came up with a hat architecture that I briefed at, um, at the Platform Security Summit. And then last year at Zen Summit, I gave her an overview of it in relation to Zen, um, specifically, uh, for Zen, I discussed how I am creating uh, an implementation of the head architecture through the Fidelis platform. Um, PX is an L0 hypervisor. Um, and right now, there is an effort underway now to build this L0 hypervisor um, such that it will be in accordance with the head architecture um, using detailed design from from the HAD architecture as well as requirements gathering from the community will help reinforce, be reinforced with some prototyping. Um, the idea is to be agnostic, but obviously the focus right now is on Zen itself. Um, and then if all goes well, the intent is that eventually it could be contributed to Zen and be a dedicated L0 hypervisor to host Zen as a, a effectively be the Zen L0 hypervisor for hosting L1 hypervisors. So a little background on nested virtualization. Uh, for those that aren't aware, the idea of doing nested vert has been around for nearly 50 years now. Um, and even then, uh, when it was first described, it was actually described in terms of a computer security mechanism to provide isolation. Um, the original concept of mechanisms are actually very similar to what you see today in hardware assisted nested virtualization. Um, and the premise that it was all built on is the idea that you could run a VMM as a guest to your VMM, which is on the real machine. And if you look at the initial work, it does a lot of discussions on how you create these function maps and, and provide a mapping from the nested VMM down to the actual physical hardware. Um, another area of nested virtualization that's relevant to P, uh, PX itself uh, was from the 96, 1996 Fluke project. What the pro approach was for Fluke was that they decided to take a, a design concept of using a microkernel and then create a nesting uh, nesting process uh, approach so that you can then have this uh, um, wrapper that they called a nester that provided a common lightweight virtualized environment for the process that it hosted. And then you could then do this recursively down and have a nester hosting a nester hosting a nester to get to the final application. Um, the reason they kind of took this approach was that um, the net you could have different types of nesters um, providing different functionality. So you could have the nester actually being a a, mo a uh, integrity monitor, and then have another nester that's just handling the actual abstractions for you. Um, and then the pr the reason why they took the microkernel approach is that. They could, uh, they could use a secure IPC specifically based on Flask, and that is the same Flask everybody knows of from SE Linux and um, XSM Flask to provide controlled data flows um, between processes. Um, and then at the time, 
it provided them a performant way to do this recursive virtualization without having the overhead of a full VMM underneath uh, in, the, in the nestings. And then obviously in 2010, the Turtles project came about and you discussed how to take the concepts from the original recursive virtualization um, from 1973 and apply it using the modern hardware um, assisted virtualization. Um, now today, that's what everybody tends to think of when they talk about Turtles all down and having uh, nested virtualization solutions. So in terms of related work, so this is not pioneering by any means. Um, you know, there's HP uh, Bromium who's done the AX hypervisor, the firmware based L0 hypervisor that works by violating uh, an L1 guest that's not aware that it is um, being virtualized um, and there's additional details for what they use that for. Um, the IBM Ultravisor, again, uh, could optionally be in firmware, but it doesn't have to be. Um, they actually, their approach is to, to leverage some specific capabilities in the power CPU architecture. And then that solution, you wind up getting a very strong isolation of security architecture. The downside is that you're now on power, um, which is has a higher bar of entry in terms of cost. Um, then you get SEL4, uh, which took a microkernel approach and leverage some hybrid assistive virtualizations to run VMs as guests within uh, one of their isolations uh, containments. Um, and then Bear Flank, I think they were at Zen Summit last year, they were hypervisor SDK, um, and they've been, uh, they've actually developed a, a solution doing an L0 hypervisor to run underneath Zen as well. Um, and finally, an, a very interesting way to look at some hardware capabilities is the Intel TDX, which is has the C module, the ACM that you load up to to provide these trusted domain VMs that are hosted away from the hypervisor, it is actually possible to kind of think of that as an L0 light hypervisor that is handling the uh, VM exits and and pro uh, propagating them over to the hypervisor as necessary. So when designing the actual detailed design of, of HAT in general, but as specifically for uh, PX, you know, there's a core set of principles that I'm, I've been building on, which is the first is just build a system that has good trust mechanisms in it. Trust is the found, trust mechanisms in particular are the foundation for both security and safety. If you have zero trust, you have zero security, you have zero safety. Um, but in particular, what you want is you want trustworthy trust, things that you know you can rely on. The mechanisms behind them have a, a stronger strength behind them. So you know the, the chance for that mechanism to break on you will require stronger attacks and so forth to, to incur that break. Um, so with that philosophy, we move into actually the approach of the design. And so the approach is that we're here to build trust, not functionality or performance. So we wanna build the trust first and then build the functionality around that. So from that perspective, looking at you know all the various ways that kernels can be designed and everything else, the focus has been on building a classical separation kernel that has properties of a reference monitor kernel. Um, function is more of an isolation enforcement kernel. Um, but the at the end of the day, you do get, there are certain monitor properties that you we're going to get from this. Uh, another aspect of this is we want to minimize complexity in the hypervisor. We only want to implement what is necessary, what is essential to provide the separation and the reference monitoring capabilities that we need. Um, everything else needs to be pushed out of the kernel and then leverage an IVC that is, has uh, the properties that we want to host non-essential services outside of the hypervisor. So as far as PX is, uh, as far as the design concern, most support L1 guests that are PX aware and um, 
those that are not. So we want to be able to support both kind of types of guests. Um, but at the end of the day, we're only supporting L1 guests. Everything to PX is an L1 guest. Um, and then obviously we want to be cross architecture. So we're targeting both x86 and ARM initially in, in terms of the implementation. So here's the design. So this is, if you've seen any of my hat talks, you've seen this, there's a, a few tweaks that have been made here to help um, clarify some points that have come up from past discussions. Um, but overall, the design is still the same. You know, we want PX to still remain an overall control of the system. We divide the system into two realms. There is the protected realm and there's the end user realm. All communications going into going to the to the hypervisor or going into the protected realm or going across the protected realm must go through our secure IBC. Um, and then to help clarify about the protected realm guests. So a lot of people thought that was concerned over performance of having so many L1 guests in, in present here. And the point here is that the L1 guest was in, in, inside of the protective realm is really an isolation, isolation enclave. And the, the microvisor concept is actually has been moved to the side to kind of give that idea that it's more not um, the, the services itself could be aware and the microvisor is serving more as a library OS than a full virtualization platform protecting the service. Obviously, for just how library OSs work, if you need access to system resources, you have to go through the library. You can't talk to them directly. But whereas where possible, the protected service or the untrusted driver can more or less use the hardware directly, if, um, provided it's safe. All right, so just to dive into this even more, because again, this is a, uh, a concept that seems to have been uh, challenging in the past. So from the PX perspective, everything is an L1 VMM. The idea of the realms is not something that's baked into uh, PX itself. What PX is looking at is PX sees that it has two types of guests. It has a general purpose L1 VMM that may or may not be aware that it's there. And that VM, that, that hypervisor may actually be hosting one or more guests of its own that are not really under control of the system, uh, under the control of PX from the aspect of it ensures that, that it's isolated within its realm, but it is not directly interacting with those VMs. Whereas in a, an L1 uh, microvisor environment, you know, the, the idea is that the microvisor is completely PX aware. It's only there to host a single guest VM, um, which can or can may or may not be PX aware, but it is at least microvisor aware. And the, the distinction then really becomes a question about policy and not code, right? The idea that these L1 VMs could be, you could in theory redo this architecture or use this architecture in a different manner and you could run, you know, microvisors within the end user realm, but you know, there's scenarios for that and that that is possible. It's the understanding that when you move thing, policy is about protecting certain services and parts of the hardware. Um, let's see here. So again, so this is where the, the fluke kind of concept kicks in here. And so they, in the protected realm, you know, the, it's a microkernel. Those are all processes running. The microvisor could be thought of as a, um, as the, um, separation, uh, sorry, I left my term there, but the idea is it's, it's re replicating the fluke architecture inside of the protected realm. So again, uh, I kind of hit a lot of these points already. The, it is a concept that the microvisor is a concept that's created confusion and, and specifically around performance impacts, right? And so we want to help clarify that we can address those performance impacts without sacrificing on the security that we want to achieve using hardware virtualization as an isolation capability. 
So obviously, like I was trying to say in the last slide, the microvisor is a modern equivalent to the Flux Nester. It's there to nest a process within a VM that you have tight controls and isolation over. And you need those types of tight controls because whatever you're putting in there is either a, tr uh, a highly trusted service or a high, uh, an untrusted driver that you need to make sure is isolated away from the rest of the system. That is the purpose of the protection realm. So the so when you come to the microvisor side of the house, we can actually run microvisors in a handful of ways. And I use some Zen terminology here to help draw some parallels so people can understand it. You could have a PV microvisor that hosts a PV guest where you have trustworthy code and you need to increase your performance. You can then have an HVM microvisor where you're hosting an HVM guest with untrustworthy code code and that provides you a stronger protection mechanism about that isolation. This is what you would do for drivers. Then you have, you, we can even explore, you know, VM funk capable hypervisors or an equivalent kind of capability in which you can still have the, the stronger protection mechanisms, but you can get increased performance by allowing the calls into and out of that, um, that VM. So where does that bring us in terms of the ongoing effort? So we're transitioning out of the design phase and we're moving into the implementation. A minimal reference hypervisor has, um, has been built for that is based around injection and monitoring. Um, or, sorry, there is one that has been, that's been built around injection and monitoring that we've chosen as the basis. We did not build it. We're taking a, a minimal implementation of reference implementation and we're going to start refactoring and building on it to, to get the common environment um, for building it with Zen. Um, the other things that we're looking to do is once we get this work building within a Zen environment, we're gonna start get that code out and, and made available so people can either contribute or watch as the development is, is progressing. Um, once that's out there, we're going to start focusing on the access controls. The access controls have to be the primary citizen in this kernel. It is the, as I said, we're working on building the trust. The trust mechanism is the access controls, but it's the isolation. So we want that isolation to be the primary um, focus. Once we get to that, then we're gonna focus on the IBC. And that's where we want an HMX, so an Argo compatible, uh, IBC so that we, we can have control over the messages flowing across these domains. Um, and then once we get all that working, we should have enough that we can start to demonstrate a running an L1 Zen on top of PX. And we can start talking about flushing this out further and start building services in the uh, protected realm to provide to the L1 Zen guest. So once we're there, right, once, once this is starting to build up and, and Fidelis is becoming available, there are additional use cases um, where a PX hypervisor will be of use. Um, one of those envisioned use cases is the uh, safety uh, critical static partition embedded systems. So as I stated before, you need trust to have safety. And so therefore, if you want a safety critical system, you want a trustworthy platform that assures you that when you want something to go right, it will go right, right? That is what safety is about. When you want the action to occur, it does occur. So PX will give the basis to build a strong safety critical platform, you know, and to draw a parallel to how safety critical has been built. So PX is itself effectively a microkernel um, and microkernels have long been used for safety critical certifications. Um, there's little difference between a separation kernel and a static provisioning kernel. It's more of a conceptual problem than it is an implementation difference. Um, so the separation kernel can function as a static provisioning kernel. So PX can statically partition the system in ways even better than what, for those that have been following our hyperlaunch work, this goes well beyond what you could do with hyperlaunch. This takes it to, a, to the next level as far as what you could do with static partitioning um, and addresses some of the shortcomings that we won't be able to deal with immediately with Zen in terms of that. 
Um, and that's kind of what I'm driving here in this last point, right? We can now statically partition the, the system resources and have services running under microservices under the protected realm. Um, and then we can provide general purpose hypervisors in the end user realm for the management and user interactions. So where, where are we going next? Well, obviously I have my goals. I have my design uh, properties I'm trying to put into the system. I have my requirements that's driving this, but we're also very open to listening to what other requirements and trying to ensure that uh, the end goal is to get this up, this or something like it into the Zen proper. Um, so obviously we want to hear requirements that we may not be thinking about that others might have. So at this point, I'm open for questions. If there's any points people would like to make, I'd love to address them. Uh, so Demi, if PX is a SEL4 and a microvisor is an SEL4 protection domain, yes. So that's where you're rolling back up to the hat architecture. The hat architecture by itself is an architecture and it, and it identified certain properties it expected a, of, of an entity that operated within that architecture. So if I go back to um, the architecture slide, the top level slide here, right? This is effectively the hat architecture, just a little more focused on PX a little bit here. You could run anything as a protection hypervisor as long as it's providing you the goals you want or, or the, the goals that it's supposed to provide, right? The architecture is validated that it can, if it can, um, an implementation is a, a proper uh, representation of the architecture provided that it meets the goals of every component in it. So yes, you could use SEL4 as your protection hypervisor. You, you could then use isolation enclaves to do a pre SEL4 protection domain. Um, and then you can also run a, uh, what I can't remember the name of it, but you can run the, the where you got a VMM inside of a protection domain to do your end user realm. Um, yeah, so, you, right. You, I'm not going to go down the path of formal verification, but yes, there are approaches to formal verification that a CL4 has already achieved and then, and similar methods might be necessary depending on what cert type uh, safety certification you're going for, because typically there's certain sa safety certifications that would prefer to see a functionally proven kernel um, beyond just a test proof of, of capabilities. And thank you, Christopher, for Pat, uh, posting the uh, 2020 slides. It's actually, I have them in the references here. Um, so there are references for anybody that wants to take a look at any of the previous work as well as um, any of the historical work. Uh, let's see here, Scott, for hosting an L1 hypervisor, PX still has... No, so that... So for an L1 hypervisor, it has to emulate vert extensions for the L2 process. No, no. The whole idea is that the, the there have been um, demonstrations of this before. As we said, Bromium has, that has an approach like this as well. You don't need to emulate all of the virtual extensions in the L, of the L2 um, in the uh, L0. Um, you can... Um, but the, that then, um, from a security standpoint invalidates what we're trying to achieve here, right? Um, the purpose of this architecture is not to prove what could be done from a performance standpoint, but focus on the security and then address performance. And, uh, and on top of it, I, I believe that you will still be able to gain that adequate performance by pushing all of that out. Um, the whole purpose of PX is only to provide the L0. Um, that is where the, the hat talk would come in really good because I kind of really dive into that. The discussions about the fact that hypervisors have gotten too fat. We need to disaggregate the hypervisor itself, break them up, and deal with those problems uh, adequately. Uh, as far as the PX source code, yes, as soon as we get, um, I, I, I'm working on trying to get it. The, the reference and implementation I have uh, uh, or the reference hypervisor that I'm going to start building off of building within a Zen environment and then 
that will be made available and then we'll start building capabilities on top of that. Does that mean an L1 only supports PVGIS? No, no. An L1 can provide the emulation necessary for the L, its L2. That you do not have to do the L1, you do not have to do the emulation at the L0. That architecture has already been validated by AX. There's a certain amount of stuff that it, it will have to handle, but you don't have to do the full uh, emulation. That's, that's, again, this is where I dove into that in the hard hat architecture and discussing about, you know, breaking these two apart. Everybody seems to want to combine them when you don't have to combine them. I've got multiple people typing here, so. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Stack Trust. Thanks, Rich, for posting the video to to the AX discussions where they talk about these things. Okay, so just to tr uh, tr okay, so to try to clear stuff up. So the idea is, you'll still need to ex like L one will still need the hypervisor extent the virtualization extensions to be available to it because otherwise L one couldn't work. But the emulation needed right. for that will be done outside of L zero. In uh, so the you wind up having, so the way the AX solution did it is they did a hybrid approach to it in which they actually, um, I, I don't know if it's discussed in that uh, video, but they, they actually, it is controlled. The emulation is controlled by the L0, but the actual execution of it, if it makes sense, so basically they have something they call the MOF emulator that actually pushes the, the, um, emulation out of the L0's um, privilege ring. So it, it basically winds up pushing the emulation of it into the actual L1. So for instance, if in the user realm, if if the L1 hypervisor in there needed to do an emulate, it was doing a hyper, uh, dealing with a VM call, right? Something like that. Then that would get emulated. The L0 has to oversee the, L, the emulation of it, but the emulation, the actual calculation of the emulation, the processing of the emulation is done within the L1's VMCS. How about, does that make more sense there? That makes total sense, and thanks for the clarification. Also, that would be a fantastic approach for Cubes OS because we have basically this, we have a lot of the same requirements you do, believe it or not. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, I know. So that, Go ahead. That, so thanks for, that, that means, really good to know because that means that we'll be able to have nested vert and cubes at some point. <laughs> yeah, well, that, the idea is that, right, that's why we want to get this into Zen and get a good security-based nested solution into Zen that then all of the users of Zen, you know, cubes, OpenXT, any other, um, any other proprietary solutions that are built off of Zen could take advantage of all this, right? We want to make a, we want this capability to be available to everybody. And yes, AX was a created by the same people that created OpenXT and Zen Client, as well as being one of some of the original people behind the Zen hypervisor itself. So, yes. I've got two minutes, it looks like. Any quick last questions? I might not even have that much left now. All right. Well, with that, um, catch me in the, the hallway chats. If, if there's interest, I can also set up a, a design session with it. Um, apparently, as, as George was pointing out, we have many, there's still many slots available. So uh, hit me up in the chat rooms and Thank you, everybody. Have a good day.